Hi everyone, Happy New Year. I hope you had a great festive season and a good new year. I had a great time just hanging out with family and friends and playing games and drinking a lot and eating a lot and you know, all the, all the normal things. I mean, nothing really that special. Uh, but I did get a new graphic t-shirt. Um, so for Christmas, uh, you know, new year, new graphic t-shirt. And this, I got this t-shirt as a Christmas present. So. Sure, don't care. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't think that is even a share impression. But, uh, but I, I think it should be a resolution that we should all have to be more like share in the new year in 2020 or in in any new year honestly. Um, so uh, so over the festive season, uh, as usually happens, I had all these plans of things I wanted to read and I just didn't get to, to reading as much as I wanted to, but I did read a number of things. Um, so I'm going to chat about those now and, uh, and what I read over December. And uh, yeah, and I, and I mostly read some really great things. Um, so first off was this collection of short stories called Salt Slow by Julia Armfield. Um, she, this is her debut book. Um, she's a, a young British writer. And, uh, and I wanted to read this because it was shortlisted for the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award. And so I wanted to read one of the books. Um, and this was one of the ones that I was most drawn to. Um, it was published earlier in 2019. And, uh, and I'd been meaning to get to it. And, uh, and I'm so glad I did because really inventive, fun, short stories um, that have a slightly gothic or surreal tone to them or, or kind of twist to them that they'll have. I mean, a lot of them are based in reality and recognizable situations. So there'll be a, um, a group of, uh, of girls who are sort of groupies that are following bands around, but then um, uh, are revealed to, to have a very sort of sinister, uh, almost like vampiric or cannibalistic qualities um, to them, or there's a relationship between a, a man and a woman, and it, it, it talks about the, um, the, their communication with each other and how the, the man slowly turns into granite, into stone. And uh, one of my favorite short stories uh, was called The Great, is it called The Great? Yeah, The Great Awake, um, which is uh, about how people become sleep deprived and over time, uh, people's insomnia becomes a physical manifestation. Their, their shadows actually become a, a physical presence in their life and take on a, a life of their own and just sort of accompany them around wherever they go. And it's this way of, I mean, this has sort of been done in fiction before. I think um, it's, it's, I've read a novel once where um, depression became a physical manifestation in, in people's lives and, and just became this weight that people had to carry around with them. And and so in, in the same way, um, insomnia becomes uh, these uh, shadows which follow people around and then they have to deal with the physical presence of them. And it's, you know, you could say it's sort of gimmicky, but I, I think it's, it's an inventive and interesting way of talking about how there are these, you know, there are these other parts to our reality which, you know, aren't totally realistic, but, um, but which impact our lives and have an effect upon us. And, uh, and I, I, I thought that was really meaningful and interesting. So, you know, if, you're, if you enjoy Angela Carter's short stories, or more recently, Carmen Maria Machado, um, her book of short stories that was published a few years ago, if you liked that, then I think you'll like this as well. And, you know, there were some points where I felt like it almost became a formula where, especially towards the end of this short story, um, there would be a sort of twist where reality um, would be turned on its head and you would see that there, it's, it's sort of a slightly more surreal situation. Um, but, but on the whole, I, I really enjoyed how she did this. I, I thought it was meaningful and impactful um, how she wrote about this. So I'll be really excited to see what this author uh, writes next. Um, um, she was not the winner of the Sunday Times uh, Young Writer of the Year Award. Um, that went to Raymond Atribus um, for his poetry collection, The Perseverance, which I haven't read yet, um, but which I really want to read. And, uh, and uh, so it's this award, um, it doesn't just award fiction, um, it, it also does poetry 
and nonfiction, basically all genres of books. It just looks at um, young writers. And so next I read um, another uh, book that I've been wanting to get to and a writer I've been meaning to read for a long time is Mary Gateskill or is it Gatskill? I'm not sure how you pronounce her name, um, but I, I've uh, yeah never read this author before. I know she was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction a few years ago, um, but I didn't get to reading that that novel of, of hers. And this um, this is a very short novella called This Is Pleasure, and it almost like self-consciously has a dialogue with the, the Me Too movement um, because the, um, the novella is a conversation between two uh, long-term friends, a man and a woman, and uh, uh, and basically you find out that the man, um, he, he, some charges have been drawn up against him about his inappropriate conduct towards women and a number of women come forward and start speaking out about this conduct um, which is taking place over a number of years. And, uh, and the, um, his female friend kind of defends him and it, you go back and forth between their accounts and um, sort of, uh, explaining his his actions and kind of justifying them and it, it came across very like documentary like to me this I mean I've seen a lot of documentaries where you basically just listen to someone talking about their experience and their life and you can see you know almost like the wheels turning how they're justifying their own actions and uh, and I thought it was really clever and interesting how she approached this subject because you see the the really complicated ways um, that that people can get into situations like this and how because the man you know he isn't a sort of traditional sort of lecherous type character he's a very sensitive man and that's sort of the way that he ingratiates himself to to women he inspires confidence in women that they want to talk about their relationships and personal life with them uh, with him and uh, and their feelings with him and and over the course of that um, he they become very close and and then um, but sometimes he'll just have really inappropriate actions where he'll be talking really overtly about sexual acts and 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 things um, or he'll he'll start actually touching them in ways which are slightly inappropriate or, or making suggestive um, comments to them and uh, yeah it shows how there there are a lot of um, difficult borders between sort of like humor and then inappropriateness or sort of stepping over the line and you know what's what's considered abuse and and what's considered just sort of normal human interaction um, you know the I think it's really important to ask all these questions because there is no uh, definite line between uh, a lot of these things and it become, can become really blurred there's lots of gray areas um, but there are definite patterns of the the way that um, especially men's actions towards women can become inappropriate but also you know men's actions towards other men um, which can become inappropriate you know and the other way around too um, so you know it's it's a very complicated subject but I thought it was really interesting how she sort of explores the process of this and how the the female friend really begins to to question like am I just defending him because he's a long-term friend of mine or should I really condemn um, his his actions and and his conduct so uh, so yeah I thought this was a really interesting introduction um, to to this author and obviously a very short read um, so I'd like to read more by her um, if you've read something by Mary Gateskill uh, let me know um, if if you'd recommend another book by her because yeah, I'd like to read more by her. Um, I also read Ironopolis by Glenn James Brown and I, I finally got to reading this because it was shortlisted for the Portico Prize and I wanted to read something from, from that list. And this is a novel I've been meaning to get to since it was published in 2018. I, mean, I think it was published towards the end of that year and I'd, I'd really wanted to get to it at the time but just hadn't and then earlier in 2019 it was also shortlisted for the Orwell Prize for for fiction and I meant to read it then and didn't so I just thought like oh it's finally time I'm gonna read this novel and I'm so glad I did um, because it, uh, it, it takes place in a northern city in England 
and, um, and takes place over a number of decades and follows the, the lives of a number of different people in a community whose lives intersect with each other, um, mainly uh, this working class community, um, which has been sort of devastated uh, over the course of a few decades when um, the, the, the regional mining company um, shuts down and um, so it puts a lot of people out of work and puts a lot of strain on people's lives and that has a uh, reverberating effect over time within this community. And, um, but it doesn't deal with that overtly. I mean, it mainly focuses on the lives of these individuals and it's quite difficult to sum up uh, what the whole story is because it involves so many of their individual stories and you only see over time how they really intersect with each other. But it does that in quite a clever way and uses different formats. So it, it starts off in a sort of epistolary form where uh, a woman is writing to uh, a man who's researching a uh, local artist who's um, become very famous for her paintings. So he's um, quizzing the, the childhood friend of, of that artist. And you never get that artist's uh, perspective directly, um, but you hear about her from a number of different people and I like it when novels will build up a, a character through a number of different perspectives um, and, uh, and you really get to sort of see a perspective on her um, in that way, uh, but um, don't, don't ever actually get her account of her life. And, uh, and yeah, and so there's, um, so you get a real sense of the, the community over time, uh, but also um, some individual uh, occurrences that happened, um, very dramatic occurrences that happened um, over the course of, of a new year and, and to do with the number of local people who have disappeared and been murdered. And, um, and so there are so, some mysteries which are um, gradually unravel over, over the course of these different narratives from uh, characters. Um, and it deals with all different experiences of people who feel isolated and, and alone, um, people who have mental health problems, um, people who have uh, different uh, wrestling with different addictions, whether it's to do with drinking or gambling, um, uh, people uh, uh, struggling with their um, sexuality or sort of uh, their coming out stories. And, um, and yeah, so um, I, I really enjoyed how all these different stories intertwine together to give a real sense of community. And it does that thing where I, I talk about how I like before, where it's, it's almost takes the form of short stories, but interconnected short stories, um, because it does give all these different individual accounts in different formats. Um, but I thought it's really inventive how he did that. I mean, he incorporates some sort of journalistic type accounts or, or interviews or, um, so um, yeah, I, I, I thought it was really excellent debut novel and I'm so glad it's been nominated for a number of prizes now because I think it's an author that really deserves more recognition because um, he's really promising, really exciting, interesting uh, writer. So uh, yeah, I'll be excited to see uh, what he produces next, hopefully um, if he, he publishes uh, another book. And then I finally read uh, Little Women, a novel, of course, which I, I got to uh, because I wanted to see the, the new film version of it. And, uh, and I'm so glad I, I read this novel. It was just a complete and utter joy. And I had no idea that at the beginning of Little Women, um, it starts at Christmas. So uh, it was the perfect time of year to, to actually read it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and I sort of can't believe that I, hadn't read this this novel. I'd so wish I'd read this novel when I was an adolescent or teenager. I think it would have had a, a big impact on my life and I know it's had a big impact on a lot of people's lives for that reason of reading it early on in their life um, because yeah it's just a wonderful story of sisterhood and friendship and and I, I got just wrapped up in their lives like so many people have of their um, coming of age stories and how each of the sisters have their own artistic and creative impulses and, and how they pursue that in different ways and uh, their, 
their struggles and development over time and the, the hardships they encounter and the tragedy they encounter, as well as a lot of the joy and comedy in just little moments in, in their lives. I found so much of the novel really, really funny and endearing and uh, yeah, and I just, you know, I wanted to be a March sister too. And, and I had that thing of like wondering like, oh, which March sister would I be? And of course I just, I, I recognized different uh, aspects of myself in, in different parts of, of their, their lives. You know, I felt a little bit May, I felt a little bit Joe, um, a little bit Amy, and you know, I probably um, most gravitated towards Joe, I would say, even though, you know, I'm not as outwardly headstrong or opinionated as Joe is. I try to be a bit more diplomatic, um, I think, than, than she is. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, and, and I thought it's, it's interesting reading the book and then seeing the film and seeing the, the choices which were made in the film and, and some slight alterations which were made in the film. I mean, obviously, a lot was cut out of the film because you can't include everything that there was in the novel but it's interesting what she um, did choose to do like because uh, how uh, you know she doesn't go into the full story of the complications of when May gets married and um, and the, the the turbulent years of, of early parenthood um, that they experience in their relationship and and how the mother talks to May and, and and says how you know you need to accommodate your husband and make sure that your husband is still happy and I know some people have criticized the novel and the mother um, the portrayal of the mother for that reason because she um, she she almost sort of puts all of the onus on on the the wife and the daughter saying that she should um, accommodate the the, the husband um, who starts to stray and spend time with another woman. Um, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I thought, I, 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 and I sort of took issue with that as well, and I thought it was interesting how in the movie it becomes more about the, what the wife wants and the wife indulging in her pre pleasure of, of wanting to, you know, get some cloth to make a new dress, which is the sort of indulgence that um, she knows that the, the family can't afford, but um, but she wants to do it anyway. And it's more the husband who has to make the compromise to to um, to to want to keep her happy in in her life. And uh, and I thought it was interesting how the film makes the, that choice. Um, but uh, but I did find the mother a really sympathetic character overall. I mean, I think she could have just been this this very. Um, placid, just sort of nice, good person because, you know, she's charitable, she, she wants to give up their, their Christmas breakfast to a less fortunate neighboring family and, uh, and, and uh, you know, she could be just this sort of goody two-shoes. But I, I thought it's, it's such a great moment when she's talking to Joe and, and says um, and is trying to uh, t tell Joe that, that she should quell her, her anger um, because she feels angry every day of her life and and um but she's she's learned how to deal with that and wrestle with that and uh you know and i think we all have those feelings of frustration and anger and and we could just go around and rampage at the world the whole time but actually you have to you you have to deal with those feelings and then say like well no i'm i'm gonna try to be positive and and have you know a good mental attitude sort of in everyday life because otherwise yeah we would just um be be at each other's throats all the time and uh, and you know and i think you know and i you could just say that's a sort of a really twee like moral lesson but but i thought it was really meaningful and and really lovely and um, and yeah, and, and it's interesting how the choices she makes in the film about Joe, whether Joe is going to get married or not, and how um, how Alcott actually felt that she she had to write the ending where Joe got married because that's what the the readership wanted and uh, and felt pressured to do that. And uh, and uh, but in the film, um, it, it does this interesting twist where you could say um, Joe does get married and and that is what happens, but Joe becomes. Um, you know, she she's a writer, and but she becomes almost the author of the the story of Little Woman, and and uh, and and you don't know whether she gets married or not because um, Alcott herself never got married, and and I thought that was a really clever way to end 
the the film a really good like modern take on the film because I know some critics have said like oh why did this film need to be made it's been made a number of times before and I think this sort of updated version of it um, is an interesting take on it and I never have seen any of the the earlier versions of it like um, the the there was a 90s version wasn't there with Winona Ryder and Susan Sarandon which I would like to go back and watch now um, because uh, yeah I'd, I'd be interested to see how that's been handled in the film before but um, but yeah so it was just a wonderful experience just like complete joy like I can think of a better gift for December to, to read Little Women and then to, to see the film version of it it was just a you know complete pleasure um, and then I also read Deborah Levy's novel, The Man Who Saw Everything, um, this absolutely beautiful cover to it. And uh, obviously this was long listed for the Booker Prize. Um, it, it could very well be uh, listed for the Women's Prize um, in a few months' time when, when that's announced. And, uh, and, and I, I thought this was a really interesting, good novel. I don't think I enjoyed it quite as much as I was expecting to. Um, but, you know, she's a very particular writer in her style of writing. It, it, um, it, uh, there's, there's no sort of linear traditional storytelling that, that she does. And I really admire her for, for that, that fact um, in, in one respect. But in another, it, it makes it a slightly frustrating reading experience in that going through this novel, I, I felt like you know, I couldn't predict from one sentence to the next what she was going to say or what she was going to talk about. So it follows the story of a man um, who is um, having his photo taken on the famous Abbey Road um, street crossing that the, the Beatles had taken their photo um, for for an album cover. And, um, and he gets hit by a car and um, not much happens like he he's not really um injured by it and just sort of carries on but then um, many years later he's hit by a car in the same spot and he's seriously injured sort of halfway through the book um it, it shows that and and um and yeah and it explores this sort of dual realities of of how um, because he's a historian and a student of um, communism, so he travels to Berlin and there he falls in love um, and has a affair with a, a man who is hosting him um, while he's there, but he also has an affair with her sister. And so it's sort of um, about all these dualities between East and West and between being a man and a woman. Um, he wears this pearl necklace all the time, so he, um, he sort of, uh, yeah, has these sort of lines between being a man and a woman, um, um, but also um, in sexuality, um, uh, uh, borders between different sexualities. And, uh, and so, yeah, it, uh, but, but also, um, um, rather than these sort of politicized um, borders between due to two different things, um, it explores um, the the borders between different time periods because the, it, it becomes very messed up with what time, what year it is, um, what's happened in the past and what's happened in the future. Um, it all becomes very muddled and confused and um, and like a lot of people have praised this novel as a different way of exploring memory because um, it, it does show how in our individual experiences we have our own subjective point of view of memories and how our memories become really confused and is it, it is it like well did that take place in in the past or is that still happening in the present and it all becomes mixed up and muddled and and I really enjoy how she she does that um so so I looking at it from that perspective I just in, enjoyed this this novel but I wasn't able to form a real attachment to the the characters I think for for that reason because it didn't have that kind of traditional plot and storyline to it um I I just felt like I I couldn't really get to know them though I thought they were really interesting like his long-term girlfriend who he is with at the start of the novel is a photographer and I think it's really interesting how it gives that different perspective of um, her experiences um, from his experiences and how you know if, it, if this novel was from her point of view it would probably be a very different book um, so uh, yeah, I I don't know. I, I thought I thought it was really interesting way of looking at different histories, but um, but I didn't fall in love with this novel in I think the way that I was expecting to. I I probably 
prefer her previous novel Hot Milk over this or her more um, autobiographical or memorist um, writing that she's done. I, uh, but uh, but I, I did really enjoy it and, um, and yeah, it was a very enjoyable experience um, reading this. Um, so, so that was my December. Uh, let me know what you read in December, um, some of your highlights um, that you've read and what you're looking forward to reading in the new year um, now that we're here in 2020. Um, so I'll um, speak to you again soon and I uh, hope you're doing well and uh, yeah, happy reading everyone. Bye.